Let's all stand, please. Let's turn our hearts towards God and pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we pause now to give you thanks. We say that you are worthy. We say that you are awesome, God. We say that you are holy, God. This morning we say that there is absolutely none that is like you. Oh God, we humble ourselves in your presence one more time. Lord, with our imperfections we come. But Lord, you have bid us that we come to give you all praise, worship, glory, and honor. And so this morning, God, we present ourselves as unclean vessels before you, asking, O oh God, that you may clean us up so that we may shout your praises, so that we may honor your name. We thank you, God, that you have brought us here in our right minds. There may be those, God, that are ailing with health issues. So we present them to you this morning, God, because we know that you are the great healer. Heal this morning, oh God. For those, God, that are experiencing emotional issues and are still here standing before you today, God, we ask that you may minister to their hearts. To those who may be suffering from the loss of loved ones, we lift them before you today, God, and ask that you may give the necessary comfort. Father, we believe that today that you are here to minister as we would avail ourselves in worship to you. I pray, God, that every man, woman, boy, and girl may recognize your Holy Spirit's presence here in this place today and may honor you because you are deserving of it all. Father God, we place before you all distractions of any form today that they may subside and that your glory may fill this place. I pray, God, that our thoughts may be consumed with you and nothing else because we've set aside this time to be with you. Help us to bask in your presence, God, as we give our hallelujahs. We pray there, God, for the ministry in song, in testimony. We pray, oh God, for our worship in giving. We pray, oh God, for the worship in the ministry of the word today. That when all is done, we will say we have worshipped you. And God, we are asking you humbly to be pleased with our worship. And now we look forward in anticipation as to what you're going to do as we avail our hearts to you this morning, God. Have your divine way. Have your divine way, O oh God. In Jesus' name, it's our prayer today. Amen. Please remain standing.
one more time. You are the word. Help me sing. You are the word.
morning I was just reflecting on this song that says you are God alone from, the fo from before time began he sits high on his throne and he is God alone and then I realized that there's actually no scheme no evil no plans of the enemy nothing that you and I can do that can change the God that we serve because he is unchangeable there's nothing that can stop him because he's unstoppable there is nothing that can move him because he's unmovable and when I recognize the power that we have through Jesus Christ I revel in this song that says you are God alone this morning I want us to sing this song with reverence as we recognize as we declare who he is the Almighty One sing with me this morning You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. Help me sing, you are. You are not a God created. That's right. By human hands. You are not a you God. Are not a God's
Jesus, he's so great. He's able to do anything that we could ever think of. And even above and over what we could even want or think or imagine for ourselves. That is why he's greater. That is why he's able. Because I know, I know he's able. Because that's just my testimony this morning. greater than we could ever think. Hallelujah. Exceedingly
morning, saints. Great to see you in the house of God this morning. Some great things have been happening, and um, I just tell you, I am absolutely ecstatic of how God is moving and what he's doing in the lives of the people. And if we were to be silent about this, it would be, it would be an injustice. And often in our worship time, we give opportunity for people to share of how God has been blessing and what God has been doing. And particularly, this is third Sunday, as you've seen a couple of the youth are here and um, participated in receiving the offering. Some of them just came off the youth um, camp, the Vinci Splash camp. They're going to be active this Saturday again coming up in the communities and um, just appreciating our young people. Uh, and I don't know if there is one of them that will want to come this morning and just share from their heart. I mean, I'm not putting, uh, you know, it is with young people, but I mean, if, if there is one that would like to come this morning and just share a little bit with us, I certainly appreciate that um, from our young people. They are a very energetic group. But while they are coming, if there is someone else that would like to come and share their testimony with us. Um, this opportunity is for you to, again, take time to say thank you, Lord. It is part of worship. It really is indeed a, a part of worship to, to just say thank you, Lord, for what you have done. So if there's somebody who is bold enough to just come right up here and stand. Is there somebody behind me? Okay. Oh, we have a young person also right behind me. Oh, go ahead. Good morning, everybody. Last week, I week before, I had the opportunity to go to Vintage Splash 2018, and it was different to other camps that I have been to before. It was, usually we have big groups, and this group was um, relatively small. And at the beginning, it was kind of heartbreaking, honestly that there weren't as many people. But by the end of the first day and going into the next day, we understood why the group was small. For those of you who don't know, the um, theme for camp this year was loving your hashtag selfie, appreciating God's masterpiece in the mirror. And as I said before, going into the second day, the morning, we realized why the group was so small. Because Sometimes young people, other people as well, but most of the times young people don't like to ex express themselves in express negative emotions. And it, I saw for myself that there were people on camp who were hurting, whether it is spiritually, they, are, they lack confidence, they have low self-esteem, and they don't believe in themselves. Some of them don't even believe that they have purpose. And I think having such a small group and we had different people coming in to speak about us, Uncle Pastor, Pastor Richards included. Sorry about that. And he took a different perspective to other people that came in. We had a psychologist come in um, to speak, about, speak to us and then Pastor Richards hit the nail on the head when he said that everybody has a purpose. And sometimes we think that these things and these things that people say are cliches, but honestly, everybody has a purpose. And your purpose, my purpose, let me use myself as an example. My purpose might be to just come down here and to arrange chairs. My purpose might also be to be the prime minister. However minimal they may seem to some people, everybody has a purpose. And that really got to me. And I think as young people, we like to tear each other down sometimes. And we have to remember that as God's children and as God's creation, we have to build each other up and to remind each other every so oft ever so often that God loves us. Like really, really, really loves us. And that's what all I want to share today. Everybody has purpose. God loves you. And we at KBC love all our young people and everybody else here. Thank you. Okay. 
God is able to do everything he said he would do. He will not leave us, he promised us. He will not forsake us. The 13th of last month, I got up um, one Wednesday morning and I felt my heart was as if it wasn't there. And I was wondering, what is this? Anyway, I stood the Wednesday, the Thursday, the Friday morning. I said to myself, I'm going to the clinic and ask them to double check my pressure because I'm not sure what is going on. He said, Ma, you must eat too much last night. I said, no, I didn't eat anything last night, but my stomach is not feeling well. So I went to the nurse and I told her what was happening and she checked my pressure. She said it was okay. She checked my everything and she said she didn't like how the heart is beating and so on. So she took me to the doctor and then they take me from the straight over casualty where I spent almost four days. Just could not breathe properly. And uh, I will tell you how God is so good. After that, I came out of the hospital the, the Sunday evening, I stayed home Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Saturday, I went to the supermarket. And as I got into the supermarket by Randy's, I start shaking. And it's like I could not hold anything in my hand. I could not even balance myself. So I said to one of the supervisor, come help. I said, give me something hot to drink. She went and she get me some hot water and I tried to drink it. My son was helping me. And by that, I have to be rushed to the hospital. While I was there, I was asking for a sheet at least to lie down on the ground, and they were saying, no, we're not putting you down. We're not putting you to lie down. And they couldn't put me to lie down. I was there until next morning, where they started to stabilize me and so on. And then Sunday afternoon, they sent me home. There was, I was asked to go to the imaging center to do some tests, and um, the money was a huge one. But I tell you, the very minute I walk out from imaging center after making the appointment, a lady was passing in the car. She said, Bushy, what happened to you? How are you looking? So I said, I'm not feeling well, and I told her. She said, come with me. She gave me some money to pay, one side. By the next day, I got $500 to pay for the, a part of it. And I tell you, God has been moving, 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 moving in my life. I keep saying to my children, do not, do not forsake God. Do not forsake him. Because if you forsake him, he's going to forsake you. And I said, lose, use your mother as an example. Because for everything, I give God thanks. And I will tell you, I see everything that's happening to me before it happened. Everything going to happen to my family, I see. Even to other persons, I see before it happened. And I would tell him in the morning, and I would say, like, Mommy, the Holy Spirit is always with you. I said, because I'm always constantly praying and ask for his, his deliverance and his comfort and his journey mercy. And I tell you, God has been so good. I want to say to this church, maybe somebody will tell us, oh, that sister in the church here and this, other ah, sister in the church here and that. Don't worry. At the end of the day, it is you and Almighty God has to talk. Right? And if you are not close to him, you would not be able to speak to him. You will not be able to see him. And you would live a life that would fail you in the end. My dear sisters and brothers, God is moving in our life. He is moving in this church. And I pray that each and every one of us who are here and not in a Bible study group, please, Find yourself in a Bible study group so that you can be strong and be firm and grounded in the Word of God. Thank you very much, church, and have a blessed day. And we all must trust Jesus for everything, everything, everything. Thank you very much. Amen. This is a good time for us to erupt in some crazy praise. You know, I've been, I've been thinking... Why, why am I here? Why are you here on earth? And I was looking at a movie the other night and um, started dissecting the, the body. And when you, I started thinking, boy, this, this body is intricate. How does it work the way it works? Who caused this? Only God. And if God who can create such in Call the word for me. 
says, listen, if you praise me, if you worship me, I will operate on your behalf. Then I, I believe that it is upon us to just go crazy with praise for a most holy God. It's why we were created. But listen to this. There are orchestrations that are always happening to take your praise and your worship away. It could even be a smell in the atmosphere. It distracts you. It could be somebody's big hat. It distracts you. It can be some foolish thing. It distracts you. But it was well orchestrated to take away the praise from Almighty God. Today, I am declaring He is deserving of our praise. Whether you're sick, whether you're well, whether you're wealthy, whether you're poor, whether your husband treating you good or bad or your wife doing it, it does not matter what is happening. This time is God's time. And he is saying that in a period where so much of the world is just going crazy with loving self and so little as spending the time to just genuinely praise me, this morning I say, doesn't matter what happened last week or in the week with you. You've messed up. Human look after other human and say, you see what you've done? But our God look at you and say, I see what you've done, but I love you still. And I beckon you to come and worship me because that's all I want from you. That's all I want from you. I've created you so that you can worship me. Let's do that today. Let's all stand. There's something about the atmosphere. Some seconds ago, the atmosphere was heavy, but I just feel there is a release in the atmosphere. And there is an anointing that is flowing at the moment. So like Sleepy said, don't let nothing distract you. I want everyone in this room to just bow your heads for 30 seconds. Is there something in your life that you think that is worthy for you to praise God for? Is there something that you know that for this God deserves glory? That for some of us that escaped depression, it wasn't because we were too smart, but because God was there by our side. Just release yourself in his presence and think about the things he's done. I've seen someone who died just because of headache. Someone committed suicide just because of heartbreak. But for some of us, we've been through worse. But we're still standing. Doesn't he deserve it? Now leave those hands if you can, no matter how you feel, you feel tired. You no matter what you feel inside, just lift up your hands and lift up your hands so you gaze. And be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors. And let the king of glory come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord our God, strong and mighty. Mighty in battle, this King of Kings, this Lamb of God that sits and reigns on the throne. The angel song is Hallelujah, and let us lift up our voices together and worship Him. You deserve, you deserve, you deserve, you. Say right there. You, 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 you. I wish I could hear some worshipers back there. I feel it in the room. Come on, say it on top of your voice. Say it. You.
Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Over the weekend, I I had so many programs to sing at. And I could see people, they were so hungry to worship God. And some were on the floor worshiping all through the night. And then I said to myself, is God ever tired of praise? I know what's the answer. For some of us, or for most of us, we only have this moment once in a week. And it's not enough. So if you have just 30 more seconds of worship Him this morning, come on, go ahead and do it. This is the food that God eats. This is the drink He takes in. So when you deny Him, you starve the Almighty. When you just stand and watch, you starving the Almighty from what He eats. For God inhabits the praises of His people. Come on, lift those hands one more time in the room. Lift your hands. I'll just say yes. You lead the way. I'm not afraid of what it means for me to say Say yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Anybody to say yes today? Say that again. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. If you want me to praise you, You can count on me. I'll just say yes. I'll just say yes. Yes, Lord, you lead the way. I'm not afraid of what for me to say. This is life. This life you It's not.
different people because the doctor said I had about six months to survive and that was 11 years ago but I'm still alive there is someone who's been told he or she has just five days to survive cancer but you are here alive so 
before I leave here, I just wanted to make that word personal and say, my chains are gone. Without the music. I've been saved. Chains are gone. My chains are gone. I've been set free. towards me. Have any one of you in this room has ever been beaten so that you have to pretend it to be dead so that the blows would stop? I've been there. I've been beaten. I've been abused. You know, there was one time a gun was held to my head and I gave up. I said, Lord, I'm not going to fight this anymore. I just give it up. You know, I just, I was just tired of fighting. So I just lie down and I just give it all up. I give it over unto God. You know, and right there and then the blows stop. And I've put my trust in God. From there on. So when you see me praising, and when you see me worshiping, it is from within. Because I know where he has brought me from. I know what he has delivered me from. So I can stand here boldly today that God is good. And he has been good and he's going to remain being good. So saints of God, let us not forget what God has done for us. You know, at the time I had to be rushed to the, the hospital for an emergency surgery. Because I had this fibroid that was so big that was resting on my kidney. I was swelling on this side. You know, when I got that news, I said, Doc, I can't do that today. I have to go home and digest this news because this is something new to me. I went home and I prayed about it. And the next morning, I went for my surgery. And God has been good to me. Today, I'm standing here. I'm 50 years old. I've gone through it all. Because of the mercies and the goodness of God. So when you see me praising and when you see me worshiping, just know where I've came from. It is because of God. May God bless us all. I did say that this is a series for, I know that it's reaching thousands of people, but this is really from my heart, a series for Kingston Baptist Church. I know that I did ask for all KBC members and all of the, what we call the KBCers um, to be here for the duration of the series and I let me let me just look at you right now and say I appreciate you um, taking the time to be I know that many of you are taking the time to be here um, it's not every Sunday that people can be at church for whatever reason um, you know stuff come up but I've been watching and I've been seeing the effort made on the part of our KBC members and on, on the part of our KBCers to receive this series and let me just tell you um, what the reason is for this. I, again, 
feel within my heart that we just need to get some things right. We just need to get some things right. We had three weeks off. Um, basically, well, three more Sundays here. The next week we are transitioning, and I really want for us to transition on a high. And so the Lord has laid on my heart a series of um, teachings that I want to transmit and that I have to be very deliberate about transmitting so that it's not really a hyped up kind of thing and emo working the emotions and all of that, but that we receive something that is transformative. So as I have gotten into this series, I have come to the realization that I am not saying anything, and it, it dawned on me, I am not saying anything that we do not already know. I mean, I, I am not sharing any, anything that I share in this series. Is, this is stuff that we already know. And then it dawned on me, having come to that conclusion that I am just saying things, you know, it dawned on me what the problem is. The problem is not so much that as a body we don't know. The problem is that we don't practice steadfastly what we know. I'm going to share, therefore, some simple thoughts of how to get discipleship right with you. And these are things that you know. But then what will bring the transformation is whether or not you will actually practice these. There's a big difference between what we know and what we do. Hear me, Church of God, if we want to... If we want to start getting things right, we've got to close that gap. Hear me, please. Hear me, feel my heart. We've got to close that gap between what we know and what we do. We've got to keep closing that gap between what we know and what we do. Close the gap. And so in the book of Mark, chapter 8 and verse 34... These are the words of Jesus, Mark chapter 8 and verse 34. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And again, I repeat Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself or herself, take up the cross and follow me. This is all about getting discipleship right, not in our thoughts. This is about getting discipleship right in our actions. Christ was very passionate and Christ was very forthright about this matter of discipleship. There's no clearer passage and there's no more demanding passage in all of scripture on the matter of discipleship apart from this. He says, you cannot be my disciple if we cannot deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. Christ wants disciple. Who is a disciple? I will have you know this, that Christ was not the first person to have disciples. Christ was not the first person to have disciples. The practice of having disciples predates Christ. In the old fashion of the philosophers, Socratic style, Plato and the others, they would have 
their disciples follow them around. And this was the practice of discipleship. All the disciples would do is follow the leader around. Wherever he goes, wherever he walks, wherever he turns, they will follow, they will listen to everything that he says and they will take notes. And everything that he does, they will make a record. And then what they will do from all of these notes, they will use them to transform their own lives so that the more they follow him around, the more they will become like him. That's what they did. I saw in our... In one of the chats, um, a very beautiful, very, very beautiful uh, story of this lady who went to the silversmith. And I might not get this story right, but some of you um, heard it. And the, the silversmith is the, the guy that um, transforms the ore from which you get silver. Because silver is not as is in the ground. It comes as, a, as an ore. And it goes through a process in which it becomes silver. And she watched him. And she watched him. And he would take the ore and he would put it in the fire in the furnace. And he says, this is what it is like. And she would ask him, well, why are you doing that? Because he, he said that the, the fire is necessary to remove the impurities. And she said, well, how long... Will you keep it there in the fire? And he says, until it is done. And she asks, but how do you know when it is done? And he took it out and he put it back in and it was not done. He took it out and he put it back in and it was not done. And she said, well, how will you know when it is done? And he said, when I take it out. And I can see my reflection in it. Then I know it is done. It is that Christ wants to see himself in us. We've got to get this right. Christ wants to see himself in us. So who is a disciple? It is not only one who follows. Who is a disciple? The disciple is one who reflects Christ. And if we are not reflecting Christ, we are not disciples. I know that is a challenging word. I know that is a, a, a firm word. But if we are not reflecting Christ, we are not his disciples. In the passage that we read from Mark in chapter 8, Christ draws a line in the sand. And I feel like today, in getting things right, we have to draw a line in the sand and say like Christ, if anyone would follow him, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. He wants us to get discipleship right. He does not want and, and I know that this might disturb you when I say it. But it is not so much having a crowd that matters to Christ. It is having people who are actually following him that matters. And I suppose that what matters to Christ should matter to us as church leaders. It is not so much having a crowd. And I know some people will get this wrong. But it is not so much having a crowd that ought to matter. It is having people who follow Christ, whose lives reflect Christ. We've got to get this right. How do we reflect Christ? Frankly, church, and, and those that are listening and watching, I can spend all day talking about how to become a, a, a disciple. Um, what I have chosen, therefore, to do is just ask five simple questions. I could ask 20, but I will ask just five for starters. Just for starters. Do you really want to become a disciple? And the first question you should ask, and the first question I should ask, and we all should ask is this. Will you strive for the holiness of Christ? If you're going to be a disciple for Christ, is it within you that you want holiness? We 
We live in a Christendom and in an ecclesiological culture, church culture, church culture. We live in that kind of culture where holiness is a lost concept. Christ was holy. Sometimes we don't seem to grasp and we don't seem to understand the measure of holiness. What is holiness? The, the, the seriousness of holiness. The demands of holiness. Christ, when he came as a holy babe, spotless. The devil tried in many circumstances, situations, and occasions to try to, to, to smear his life and to bring that measure of unholiness and taintedness into his life. And each time, he would respond with the word of God and rebuff and remain holy. To be holy is to be spotless. To be holy is to be blameless. To be holy is to be without blemish. To be holy is to be untainted. And Christ actually wants us. Now follow me. Christ wants us to be holy. To make every attempt to live holy lives. But what seems to be the culture in and among church people. Hear me well. What seems to be the culture in and among church people is a preference for another life other than the holy life. And if we are not careful, church, if we are not careful, we taint ourselves that are supposed to be holy. We taint ourselves with the trappings of the world and so we lose this insignia or this sign of holiness. And we live among young people and older people who would rather be more like others than be more like Christ. And, I, and that there are people who would take more pride in emulating um, some cartel fellow. And no more of his teachings and lyrics and his vi vibes. That's what it is. Vibes cartel. Yeah, that's it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Who will know more of his word than they know the word of God. There are people who uh, adore Jay-Z and, 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 and walk like him and they can't dress like him. Trust me, you can't. You can't afford to anyway. Some can. And, and Beyonce and, and, and the way that she's done up her hair. I can't tell when last I've seen that. But the way she's done her hair and, 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 and nails and eyebrows and what I someone I heard this word yesterday, fleek. And I thought that was a term my company in town, but I was told no, it's not. And who is Eminem? And we have our stars and our models and our singers. And our artists and, and people that we, uh, we, 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 we tend to want to emulate and be more like them. I watch it. So an artist runs a tattoo up his arm. And then before you know it, there's a spate of people running the, trying to run that same style of tattoo. And I'm not saying that hats and pants and, and the lack thereof, or if you wear them, these are the things that make you holy. But we are not that careful about what we are tainted, what we are tainted with. We are not that careful of the emblems and the spirits that come with them. That's a whole different message. And, and the, the things and the rings and the piercings and the meaning of these things before you put them on. You need to be more careful. You are a child of God. You need to be more careful about the messages you send. The, the subtle message because you dwell in spiritual warfare. The subtle message you send as advertisers for the enemy. Agents for the enemy who advertise his spirit by the way you pull your pants or your shoes. Or, there are messages, subtle messages that are embedded. And these ambassadors that are sent by the enemy, popular though they are, you are following them and you are in, 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 in perceptibly you are carrying that message. You are tainting your holiness children of God watch it 
language and I try to be more, very careful with my language because I am a child of God. Mind you, language morphs over time. I know that. And therefore, my language will morph over time. But I don't have to morph my language to such a point that I'm speaking the language of the world. Be careful what you put in your tweets. Be careful what you put in your WhatsApp. Be careful what you put on social media. Be very careful. I have seen a whole heap of abbreviations used by Christian people and I ask myself what does L-M-H-O mean? And I suppose you mean laughing your head off. But shame on you when you use the A because that's not Christian and that's tainting yourself. Come on. Christ will never do that. <laughs> Don't get me started. A disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ, come on, get it right. You don't have to love the world so much that you choose to follow its patterns and its language and its culture more than you follow Christ. Discipleship is serious business. Get it right. Who are you following? Get it right. Is it that we have chosen to ignore 1 Peter chapter 1, 14 to 16? Isn't it, is, is, is it true that we have chosen to ignore Romans 12, 1 and 2, 2 that says, Do not conform to this world, but be ye transformed. Let me say this again. It is the word of God. Do not conform to this world, but be ye transformed. 1 Peter 4, 14 to 16 says, Don't conform to your desires. Be holy as the one who called you is holy. This is the word of God. If we are to get discipleship right, we have to know whom we are following, whose lifestyles we are following, whose tastes we are following, whose values we are following and imbibing, whose life... We've got to know who we are following because disciples follow their master. And who is your master? Jay-Z is not my master. Eminem is not my master. Certainly Beyonce is not my master. Vibes Cartel and the others, they are not my master. My master is Christ and I would rather follow him. Boring that may seem, I would rather follow him. If we are to get discipleship right, we must strive to follow in the holiness of Christ. It is one thing, my brothers and sisters, it is one thing to know it up here. But tomorrow, whenever, when, when we begin to message and talk, uh, are we transmitting that sense of holiness? When we interact with people, are we transmitting a sense of holiness? Now that's where the rubber hits the road. It is not enough to know it. It is not enough to know that we should be holy. It is more than necessary for us to practice what we know. Secondly, secondly, how, second question, will you demonstrate the love of Christ? That's a second simple discipleship question. It's not just about holiness. A disciple in the old disciple fashion, who would follow his master and make notes, must have seen that Christ was a Christ of love and compassion. And would therefore understand if we are to follow this master, if we are to be his disciples, we too must have love and compassion. The love of Christ is unlike the love of the world because the love of Christ is is an unconditional love. The love of Christ is a strange love because it is a love that is patient. The love of Christ is kind and it is not about self. The love of Christ is not easily provoked. So it doesn't get riled up all that easily. It doesn't get riled up as the love of Christ. So the, the true disciple, now watch me, the true disciple would have followed him and would have watched him and would have seen how people pushed his buttons, but somehow he just did not get riled up. That is the love of Christ. It is not easily provoked. The love of Christ has a way of thinking about people. The love of Christ doesn't think negative. The love of Christ doesn't think evil. It thinketh no evil. 
That is the love of Christ. When I see someone, whatever the situations or circumstances, you would watch how Christ would have dealt with them, whether it was the publican or whether it was Bartimaeus or whether it was the layman or the woman caught in adultery or the woman at the well. The love of Christ thinketh no evil. The love of Christ thinketh in positive terms about people. That's the love of Christ. That's what I want to be. If I want to be a disciple of Christ, I will watch him and see how he does it. It beareth all things. The love of Christ keeps no record of wrongs. The love of Christ doesn't rim. The love of Christ doesn't keep a ledger. The love of Christ doesn't keep accounts of all the things that you have done wrong. The love of Christ is a gracious kind of love that forgives all wrongs. And so the disciple of Christ, my brothers and sisters, and so the disciple of Christ therefore emulates this love of Christ when will the church get it right when will we move and transfer this knowledge that we know when will we transfer it into our actions and how we deal with people we've got to get this right we are not his disciples when we can't even love a brother or a sister we can't love uh, we can't love difficult people are we as disciples, when uh, somebody we encounter, they are very difficult and we find it impossible to love them because they are so difficult. Then we are not disciples. We've got to get this right. When we meet selfish people, which we will, this is the world. Come on, there are selfish people. Wake up. We will encounter them. Can we transform them with love? I know, and, and if I if were to ask you to, there are, there, are, there are people that are insidious. There are people who are spiteful in your life. There are people who are vengeful in your life. There are people who are up to no good in your circumstance. There are people who are repulsive around you. <laughs> and how do we respond to them? How do we respond to people who use you? How do you respond to people who despitefully use you? I say to you that the disciple of Christ responds with love. This is getting it right. This is getting it right, church. Come on. When will we get it right? In 1 John chapter 4. And 19 to 21, and, and the word of God is so clear and so fresh in my mind. It is, it is an indictment. It says this. If you can't love your brother and sister whom you can see and you live around, you're around them. If you can't love people that you're seeing, how can you love a God that you cannot see? There's no love. If you read the whole of four, John First John 4, there is no love in us. There is no love for God in us if we can't love fellow man. I will not relent from this. There is no love of God in our hearts if we can't love our fellow man. We've got to get this right. People will be imperfect towards us. People will treat us and slight us. People will treat us wrong. They will slight us. People will scorn us. People will do all manner of evil. People will say all manner of evil. But we have to love them. This is the transformative action of a disciple of Christ. This is what makes us different. We've got to get this right. I would hope if I were to end the sermon now, I would hope that there is someone in this audience and um, by media who will say to themselves, I've got to get this right. I've got to be a disciple. I've got to learn to love. I said five Simple questions I want to ask. Just to evaluate our discipleship. Are you getting it right? You've got to get it right. There might be someone in your life right now. Who they're, they're like 40 grit sandpaper. <laughs> yeah, somebody over there knows about 40 grit sandpaper. It's a rough kind. Really rough kind. And when you rub it, it scrapes and all of that. And there might be somebody in your life like 40 grit sandpaper. But you've got to love them. I hope this word today is transformative, Father. 
transform not only our minds, but transform our actions with these words. The third question, if you want to be a disciple, the third question is this. Will you practice the prayer habits of Christ? Now, this is a tough one. Because most people have such little understanding and affinity for prayer. Um, don't really comprehend the value, purpose, and power of prayer that they hardly pray. And you do this more, not that you're intentional, that you don't want to pray. It's just like you don't get it, so you don't pray. Prayer is all about communicating with God. It's this conversation. Not a monologue with God. It is a dialogue with God. There's a big difference. Prayer is about feeling a connection with God. So that when you walk into prayer, whether you lie down, you kneel, you lean, you stand, you drive. I do a lot of prayer while I'm driving. I have to. Because there's a thing called minivan. Van drivers are somewhere saying the same thing about me. Prayer is about you. Prayer is this zoning in with God. Now get me, get me, get me. Prayer is about this zoning in with God. And you shut out others so that you just spend time with God. <clears throat> That's what it is. You spend, so, sometimes in prayer, you don't have to open your mouth. Uh, so pastor, you say what you said. I said, yeah. Sometimes in prayer, you just need to just shut your mouth. People say, well, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray. Just start by not saying anything. How about that? Is that hard? Everybody knows how to pray. Pr to pray. Start by not saying anything. Start by listening. Some people want to talk before they listen. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. And when you listen to God, not when you just run and talk. Have you ever been in a conversation with anyone who loves to talk, 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 You feel like you have not communicated anything at all to them. Stop looking at your friend like that. I wish you I wouldn't say. <laughs> Stop it. Why are you doing that? Why? You can think of a few names you can fit in there. <laughs> Leave your husband out of this, please. <laughs> or your wife. <laughs> Okay, now, so it's about listening. We've got to listen. And, and when we appreciate that God wants time with us, that's what prayer is. When we rethink prayer, or when we reframe prayer, or when we reconceptualize prayer into the idea that prayer is primarily time with God, so you don't have to talk, 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 or beg, 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 or I don't know what to pray for. Just shut up and listen. Listening to the heart of God, communing with God, reflecting on, you say, Pastor, how do I hear him? A lot of people that, uh, and, and most in the United States that I visit with, uh, are practicing prayer by doing this. this I, I say, I, I was there just recently, I was talking to them, they say, um, uh, they say they're praying. I say, you're praying, yeah. I say, you're praying how? They say, I'm praying the scripture. I say, praying the scripture, they say, yeah, I'm listening to God. And what they would do in their prayer time, this is, I kid you not, in the, I'm teaching you all, I'm teaching you all something. In their prayer time, they will just pick a psalm or pick something. They will just pick a word of God and they will very deliberately just read it slowly. So they could just hear God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not, you know it? He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside, come on, come on, the still waters. He, he's wanting to just restore my soul. Oh man, this is sweet stuff. And, and, and uh, when, when you're there, you're just praying that, you're, and you're saying, God, restore. What, what, when I heard them saying this, I, they, they're personalizing it, and they say, the Lord is my shepherd. Lord, supply my needs, I shall not want. Lord, lead me beside still waters. Lord, you restore my soul. Lord, you are leading me in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. Lord, even though, and this is their prayer, they're reading it. Lord, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I know that you are with me and your rod and your staff protecting me and comforting me. Lord, you will lead me to a table in the presence of my enemies. Lord, you will anoint my head. This is a great prayer. Lord, you will anoint my head with oil, my cup 
will run over. Surely, Lord, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in your house forever. And then you say, Amen. What a powerful prayer. Somebody say, Amen. You have to practice prayer. Prayer is not hard. If you, love, if you have ever been in love, you know love ain't hard. If you've ever been in love, you talk hours on the phone. You just, if you've ever been in love, you communicate. If you've ever been in love, you want presence and dialogue. If you've ever been in love. If you love God, you will want intimacy with him. No wonder the songwriter says, as, my, as the deer pants for the water, my soul longs for thee. Prayer is this expression of longing to be with God. Prayer. In Luke chapter 5 and verse 16, Jesus, we learn, often would withdraw from the people. He had such a ministry going on. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands. And Jesus, and he is Jesus. <laughs> he is Jesus. And he would pull back from everything for prayer. Spend time with his daddy. And if Jesus will want Time with his daddy. Are we better than Jesus? You're so busy with your work and your family. You're so busy with all that you have going on. That you are you, you above Jesus. Because yeah, he could need prayer. But I don't need it. I have got too much. No, no, no. Let us not get there. We need to spend time in prayer. Prayer to me is like a topping up. If you have had the proper time with God. There is no man. There is no woman who comes into a session with God. A topping up time with God, intimacy with God, basking in his presence and hearing him and feeling him that walks away diminished. Everyone who has ever come into the presence of God leaves a transformed. Prayer is a topping up. If you want your discipleship to move to a new notch, you've got to spend time with God. And I dare say today, my brothers and sisters, it is not hard. It is not hard. It is a discipline. It will mean that you have to ignore people. It will mean that you have to ignore some of the demands of your work. You've got to put down some things. It will mean that you will have to get away from the days of our, days of our lifestyle shows. It will mean that you have got to get to, from some of that. It will mean, believe it or not, it will mean that you might have to close off your cell phone. Oh, Lord, Father. It will mean that. I may be speaking to someone here this morning. Someone who is spending more time with a friend. Someone who is spending more time in a chat. Someone who is spending more time in an activity. Someone who is giving more of their time to work and communication. And you communicate with bosses and you communicate with other people in your workplace. And you do so much more communication. But the master of your life, the one who has the blueprint of, blueprint of your life, there is very little communication. It is so easy, my friends, my brothers, my sisters. My, it is so easy. It is too easy to shut God out. And give time communicating with others. The true disciple follows Christ. And if I were a disciple of Christ at that time. And I watch him. And then he would say, I need some time to pray. I would be making notes. It's necessary for me to take time to spend it with my father. I think we got to get this right. I believe that um, Church Hemi, this is a transformative action that we need to take in our lives. We need to get this right. Men, men, men. Um, the ladies seem to get it right more so than the men. Men, so I'm challenging you today. We need to get this thing right about prayer. I've talked to men and I have said to, to them that occasionally, for no good reason, just hug your wife and just say a prayer for her. For no, just, just grab her. You have no, I, when I tell you, boy, that's good stuff right there, man. That's good stuff. <laughs> Well, you don't know. I don't know how God. I could. Well, I, God is what a woman feels like. I was about to say dollar bread and attention, but more than that, this morning, uh, seriously, uh, it, woman, come on, tell a man somewhere how you feel when he hugs you and he just prays for you. Come on, woman, tell him. Well, my wife knows what that's like, right? I'm <laughs> telling you. Yeah, Whew. it's good stuff. Well, I tell you when, 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 when and watch me. Huh? Don't wait until you all have argument to say, no, come, let me pray for you. <laughs> and figure that won't work. No, 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 no. Do it when things nice. 
Just, just hug. Just, just hug or pray for her. She, you elev- and you're not doing it to elevate yourself, but you elevate yourself to a man of tremendous stature. All the gold ring you buy and all the bling and all of that you buy can't compare to when you hold your wife. Hug and just say pray for her. Somebody say amen. And if none the men say amen, at least the woman can. <laughs> but the fourth question I want to, to ask you today is this. Will you live with the commitment of Christ? Will you live with the commitment of Christ? This passage in Mark demonstrates the kind of commitment Christ wants from his disciples. Read it again. Read it again. If any man would come after me, he must deny himself and he must take up his cross and he must follow me. That is a passage of commitment. If you would come after me, you would deny yourself, you would take up your cross, and you will follow me. I wish that we will all get this all across this auditorium. If any man would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. I wish we would all say this together because we'll get this. I'm going to preach it in a bit, but if any man must come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and he must follow me. Christ is calling for self-denial. That is part of discipleship. Christ is calling for taking up of a cross. That is part of discipleship. Christ is calling for a Gethsemane attitude. That is a part of discipleship. To get church right, we have to have the attitude of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. I've been preaching and I've been pastoring for 30-something years. And I've watched... And, and, and part of me just longs for, and part of me just prays for that kind of Gethsemane attitude among the people. And this is a serious point, and, 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 and bear with me as I share my heart. I, I mean, sometimes I feel like having, having preached for 30-something years, I've earned the privilege every now and again of just sharing my heart. And um, what... Um, and, and I have some wonderful people, don't get me wrong. I pass to some of the most amazing people. I watched yesterday a pouring rain, pouring rain, and perhaps our largest turnout of um, workers at the church. When I got there after eight, people were already there um, walking in the dirt and planting, and then other people came immediately, started pecking and shoveling and wheelbarrowing and throwing stones. I have some of the most amazing people, and I am grateful for that. But I am fully aware that not everyone is of this caliber. I am aware that the measure of commitment that is needed to do the Christ things and the, 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 the measure of commitment that is needed to do kingdom things often is not there. I am aware that there are people who put self over church or put self over God or put self over Christ or put self over the work of God or put self over ministry. I am aware of that. I am aware of the fact that many times I would call on people or ask them, come on, I need some help. I am aware that this is the work of God we are doing. And I am aware very often that I am being told point blank that, but pastor, I have this going on. This is my thing. I've got to take care of this. Now, while that is legit, while that is legit, it is too often that we encounter in ecclesiological circles and in church life, it is too often that we encounter this attitude that we will only do something for Christ or the work of God related to the church or God's work. We will only do something if we can clear the time from our calendar. Too often have I encountered that. Now, shameful. And I say that unapologetically. I say that unapologetically because I want us to get this right. I I say this because I I want us to understand the attitude of Peter who said, I have left all to follow thee. I want us to get this right, that we understand that following Christ is not a flippant attitude. And this is what transforms a church. This is what catapults a church into an active church. This kind of Christ-likeness, this kind of discipleship, this kind of Gethsemane experience. I know you're asking yourself, what is the Gethsemane attitude? What is the Gethsemane experience? I know you're asking yourself, or you're probably asking me, and I'm glad you asked me. Because the Gethsemane attitude is when he got in there and he knew what was needed and what it was going to demand of him. 
and what it was going to do to him. And he said, this is suffering. Take it from me. And then he backed up and he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And there are times in the ministry of Christ and there are times in the work of Christ and there are times in, in, in going through what God has called us to do. There are times when we have to sacrifice. That we have to give up income that we would have wanted to use elsewhere, time that we would have wanted to use elsewhere, circumstances, everything is not about convenience. It's not about convenience. And the true disciple, now hear me, the true disciple, The true disciple understands the message of Christ. The true disciple gets it, what it really means to follow Christ. That he said, if any man will be a follower, if any man would follow me, you've got to learn. Hear this, please hear this, because we know it too well. We know it so well that we don't do it. If any man would follow me, he's got to learn to deny himself. You've got to say no to yourself and follow me. You've got to say in the Gethsemane experience, nevertheless, not what I want, but what God wants. What does he want of me? You know, Paul, in writing about this, I won't belabor this point. Paul, in writing about this, said, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was equal with God and dwelled with God, didn't consider that something to grasp, but he let it all go so that he could come to earth in the form of a man and serve and to give his life. That is discipleship. That is discipleship. That is the real, that, when, when we begin to see this, like the silversmith, when we begin to see this attitude in us, that is when we begin to truly reflect Christ. It is easy to see Christ in one who is selfless. It is easy to see Christ in one who is committed. Paul, at the end of his life, said this in Timothy. He said, I have been poured out like a libation, like a drink offering. I have been poured out. I have poured myself out. Christ himself said, I did not come to be served. But I came to serve and to pour out my life a ransom for many. These are the words of God. This is true discipleship. This is true discipleship. And if we are to be true disciples of Christ, we would reflect the image of Christ in the way we selflessly serve him. The silversmith, I'll end here. I'll end, I'll, I will end here. I said I will ask five questions, but I just asked four. But you are getting this message. Oh. <clears throat> my friends and my, my, my friends and my brothers and sisters, um, I, 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 I say to you that if we are to get some things right, I do, this is a very important time. I'm, I'm seeing too many children moving around. So if you have children here, just hold them so that they don't distract me at this time of the sharing of this word. Thank you. Thank you. This is a discipline also. Thank you. We cannot, friends, friends, we cannot take for granted the requirements that are upon us as a church and as a people, we cannot take for granted and be flippant about them. And as this series has progressed, a very serious series, um, it, I, am, I am trusting and hoping that somehow the word of God, not even my words, but the word of God, I'm careful to share what the word of God says. I am hopeful that it is transforming you. I am hoping that there is some measure of transformation in your attitude to worship, in your attendance, your punctuality, your frequency, your fervency in worship. I am hoping that that word is having lasting impact, that you're really working to get your worship right. See, that's why I've asked for all of our church people to be here. I want you to get this. I want you to work at getting your worship right. Some of you are doing that. 
I also want for you to work at getting your evangelism right. I spoke last week from my heart, getting your evangelism right. And, you know, as I prepared for this week, and I sent out a message yesterday, I asked myself, I asked you also, how did you do on your evangelism this week? How did you do? Who did you encounter? Who did you share the word of God with? Who did you plant the seed with? Who did you share? Um, and I found this week as I shared again, I think I was um, at the port. I was at the port. And there was this lady there. And um, she was, and I just, there was an opportunity to just open right like that. And, I, and people love to hear about grace. She was talking to me about her boyfriend and how that was keeping her from the Lord. And then I started talking to her about how she can make the first step and the second step and transformation. It was an opportunity, so I took it. And I can go on and on, but this is not about me. I am trying to impress upon you how easy it is to share, um, you know, about Christ. Have you been doing that? Your family and your friends. I am not here just to go through a preaching series. I am here to help us to get it right. Uh, get it right. Has your evangelism been different last week? Or was that just another sermon? And then today about discipleship. What it means to... Go for the holiness that we see in Christ. What it means to, to have the kind of love, that kind of love that we see in Christ. What does it mean to be selfless? What does it mean to pray like we see in Christ? How is this? How are we, how are we reflecting Christ? How are, how, am, how are we reflecting Christ in our relationships with each other, family members, church members? How are we reflecting the holiness? How are we reflecting the love? How are we reflecting the selflessness? How are we different? How are we like Christ? And so it is my prayer that as we continue through the series that it will challenge us to transform our lives to reflect more the life of Christ. And so Almighty God, we thank you for this word. Seeds planted, no less. Seeds planted. God, I pray, oh God, that you will walk in the soil of these lives. Men and women who are listening, not just in this auditorium, but men and women who are listening all across and members of multiple local churches, oh God. God, I pray that you are challenging them through your word with respect to how they worship and their commitment to that. That you are challenging them to transform their evangelistic actions, oh God, that you are transforming them to get that right. And God, I pray that these seeds that are planted here today, uh, through your word, really, through your word, that these seeds that are planted, God, they're just your word, will not return void. And so everyone who hears these words, oh God, that they are challenged about their discipleship, how they can bring their lives to more reflect the life of Christ. Father, I pray that even right now that there are men and women that are making quiet decisions, having been impacted by this word, making quiet decisions to do this right, to worship right, to evangelize right, and to be discipled so that they're more like Christ. And I pray, oh God, that as these lives are drawn into conformity with your scripture and what is required of us to live in the right way, O oh God, I pray that there will be an impact in the life of this church such like we have never seen before, O oh God. And effectiveness I mean, in the life of this church, the ministries of this church, but more than anything else, an impact on your kingdom because we are learning to do it right. And we ask these through Christ our Lord. And we all say, Amen.